let's start populating the model hub and create a new model. When you're creating a new model, you can choose between a few different templates. Uh, we're going to go with the empty one since we're building from scratch. But if you were to select another template, you would both get a little bit of a description. But uh, when you create it, you will also be able to instantly run it. So you're two steps away from running a model by using one of these te templates. Let's create a uh, empty model and call it image classification. So what the image classification model does is that it, as name suggests, it classifies images. It, it takes some images and it tries to say what type of images it is. And we're going to use a very standard data set to start with uh, called MNIST. And for those who are unfamiliar, the MNIST data set is essentially just a data set of handwritten digits. So you have a bunch of handwritten digits between zero and nine, and you just want to figure out which digit it is. Very common to use for performance testing. Um, and the model type we're gonna use is a convolutional neural network to do this. Uh, and it's called a convolutional neural network because it contains a convolutional layer. And how they work is uh, they take a little filter and they look over the entire image. They scroll across the image. And by doing that, they can produce a new image. Uh, and since the filter part is trainable, you can essentially use it to produce any type of new image you want. So they're very efficient for processing images and they come with a bunch of benefits like uh, displacement robustness and uh, they're also very cost efficient as far as computational goes. Uh, but uh, let's get to the actual building. So to start with, we'll need a data set. So I'm going to drag in a local data component. And this one will allow me to fetch data from, from my local storage. So I'm just going to grab some MNIST inputs. And as soon as I uh, apply the component or load something into it, you see that a little preview shows up showing exactly how the sample looks like. And you also see the dimension on top of it. As you can see though, this doesn't quite look like an image. And that's because the data for this data set is a little bit different. It's flattened, which means that the, uh, the 2D image essentially just has uh, uh, taken all the pixels and placed next to each other, creating a 1D uh, array. So the first thing we need to do is to pre-process this and make sure it shapes back into an image. So I'm going to drag out a reshape component and then just connect them. And by doing that, I essentially just send the output from this component through the input on this one. And we can see now how it looks like an image rather than just a array. There are also a bunch of settings over to the right and each component has its own settings. Uh, for the reshape and the data, there aren't too many. You can do things like transposing the image if you want that. Uh, but the settings becomes more interesting for the deep learning components. And speaking of deep learning components, the next one we're going to use is the convolutional components convolution layer. So just like before, I just drag it in and apply it. And we'll see how it looks like after it uh, applies the filter to it. Here we can see a bunch more settings. And uh, we have the standard ones like patch size, stride, feature maps, which uh, patch size says how big the filter should be, stride, how many steps it should take at a time. And feature maps is how many outputs you want uh, or how many filters you should have. But we also bundled the activation function, the dropout, the batch normalization and the pooling all into the same component. So it gives a much cleaner visualization of everything that usually goes into a convolution layer. This code is also essentially a, a template for uh, generating code, uh, the settings I'm in. 
And if you want to see that code, you can always press this button and it will open up a code window for you where you can both view and edit the code. And as you can see, most of the code here is just low level TensorFlow code. So it's really easy to go in and tinker uh, with it yourself. And uh, if you need to build something custom, you can do that here. There's also a bit of uh, Preset Labs code in it, but that does all that does is modify the visualizations. So uh, if you want to do that as well, you can completely customize the visualizations. Finally, I'm gonna add a dense component. And this one will act as an output, essentially compressing uh, the output into 10 different, uh, in, into a list of 10 values. And we want 10 values since we have 10 different digits. When I've done that, we have the trainable part done. So all we need now is some labels to be able to train it against. So I'll drag out a new data component and I'll just load in the labels. As you can see though, the labels are just an integer and they don't really match against the uh, output of our current model. But to fix that, we can use a nifty little component called a one-hot component, one-hot embedding. And what it does, as you can see, it takes this five and it just places a one on the position five instead. And that way we have reshaped this one into something which now fits with this one. Uh, and finally, we can tie everything together using one of these training components. In our case, a classification one, and we just need to feed it to predictions and then the labels. And in the training component, you can uh, choose some settings for how long it's going to run, how big the batches should be, so how many images should it train on at a time. A bunch of uh, um, training settings as well, loss function, uh, optimizer, uh, uh, learning rate, essentially everything which has directly to do with the training and the training steps. And now the model is essentially ready to start training. There's two more things I wanted to show before we start training. Uh, one of them is the notebook. So we already seen the code, which you can view just by opening the code. But if you want to see all the code in the model, you can very easily go over to the notebook view and it will list all the code for you. And you can read it just like you would read a normal notebook. It's currently not changeable though, um, so it's just reviewing. But if you do want a changeable uh, notebook or something you can customize, you can always export it as a notebook. And this will give you a notebook which you can edit and run outside of the tool if you want to do that. The second thing I want to highlight is something called auto settings. What it does is that it automatically finds good settings for the model. Uh, so an example of that, I mentioned how these two dimensions need to be the same. And the reason they need to be the same is because the output needs to be able to be compared with the uh, labels for it to be able to train. And what it essentially does is just take this output, or just takes this label, compares to its own output, see, checks if it's correct or not, and then it updates its uh, parameters depending on that. So if these are not the same, it's not really going to work, it's going to crash. So if I change this one, it wouldn't work, and we automatically change the settings for you. Now, this only works on components which haven't already had their settings changed, so we're never going to overwrite anything which you do. So if we do want a crash, uh, we can very easily change it in here now. And we'll see the crash here. Um, as you can see, seven and five, they don't match. 
we can also double click on this one to jump into the code and see uh, exactly where the error is. But let's go back to something that works. There we go. All right, then let's start training it. So by training it, you just press the run button and it will create a training script, which it will then start executing. Uh, so the loading screen we're seeing right now is just when it's spinning up the model and then waiting for the data. But as soon as we have the data, uh, start receiving some data, we'll start seeing all these visualizations. Uh, so let me just pause real quick so I can go over this um, a little bit calmer. At the very top, you'll see an overview over how the training is going for your model. And this one is customized depending on which training components you're using. So the one we're seeing right now will always be the same for classification. And in this case, we can see things such as the input. We can see the accuracy, the prediction versus the ground truth, both uh, for a single sample and for a batch. We can go over and look at the accuracy, uh, how the loss is behaving, uh, also F1 and AUK scores, not really relevant for this multi-class classification, but um, there we are. Uh, so essentially everything which you would want to look at to get an overall sense of how it's going. At the bottom right though, we have something which we call the view box. And this view box you can change by clicking on, clicking on the map. And this way we can peek into different components and see exactly how they're doing during the training and get a live update on what's actually happening inside of them. So we can see things such as the weight and outputs, the biases, uh, the gradients. And the gradients are really great to look at while you're training since they, uh, if they're exploding or diminishing, it's a good indicator to say how well the training is actually going. As soon as training is done, you'll get a little pop-up saying how well it went. Which we'll see in a second now. There we go. So you get a little summary of how well the training went. And after that, you're, you can start running the tests. If you run into any issues or any feedback, please visit our forum at forum.perceptlabs.com or reach out to me directly at our Slack channel.